Our reading this morning is part of the Good Friday message and story in Matthew chapter 27, beginning at verse 27, continuing to verse 56. Matthew 27, 27 to 27, 56. Father, we thank you for your word. May, Lord, these familiar words, Lord, be brought more to the fore in our minds this day, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him, and they took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled him to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him a sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put up over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroyed the temple and built it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let God deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, This man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, and filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink. And the rest said, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. Then, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those who were with him, who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, 
truly, this was the Son of God. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, were there, looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. We thank the Lord for his word. One of the things that uh, is a problem for me, might be for you, might not, but um, I have grave difficulty with the way some people in the churches regard Good Friday. We have all these stations of the cross and all these other things. And it just seems the same script year after year. And I think it's a great shame because to me, the Bible is ever new. And what we are looking at is God's word. And if the Bible is ever new, then every time we read it, we should be getting something out of it. Whereas in some of these services that I have seen over the years, it just seems, oh, it's that, I'll just fish that out, and we just proceed with last year's updated version. And you just wonder what people do actually get out of it. I've entitled what I want to say <clears throat> something which is based on something that was said uh, to Pat and I by a very fine Christian who had a problem with Good Friday. And her comment was, what's good about it? And it, it stunned me. I thought it was obvious. So my title today is, What is Good About Good Friday? When we look elsewhere, we see people remembering Good Friday in different ways. It may be <clears throat> in connection with what I will call the church calendar. <clears throat> Excuse me. A tradition. We always do it this way. A ceremony. If we think, honestly, of Good Friday in those terms, we've strayed from the real meaning. Today, we particularly remember the events which led up to the crucifixion or execution as we could call it of Jesus our Messiah outside Jerusalem all those years ago but there's something that we need to remember like all things concerning Jesus it's very difficult to talk about them in isolation. You see, if he hadn't come in the way that he did at Bethlehem, and I don't just mean being born in the stable, I'm talking about the virgin birth, that alone is crucial to our understanding of who Jesus is. But it wasn't the only thing. Because the other important events that took place during his 33 years of life are crucial to our understanding of Jesus. Perfect God and yet perfect man. The other things, of course, are 
his crucifixion because without his crucifixion there couldn't have been a resurrection and if there hadn't been a resurrection there wouldn't have been the ascension and if there hadn't been the ascension he wouldn't be coming again because he wouldn't have been coming the first time after all that. So we see this sequence of events. And whilst we may not be actually talking about them, it's important that when we think about any particular part of it, we look at it as it were within the overall picture. I'd like to just give you a little example. It happened over 40 years ago at work. There was a man called Bill. He was a lovely fellow. He was never going to be one of this world's high flyers. He was one of what we call the salt of the earth. He came a long way to work. His home was at Wellingborough in Northamptonshire. I can't remember Bill ever being late. He worked hard. I hadn't any complaints at all. And on top of that, he was one of the most polite people you had ever met to staff and customers. One day, he came up to my desk, which was just across from his, and he said to me, could you spare a minute? I said, yes, sure. And he asked me a question, a technicality regarding the banking. And I gave him what was just, if you like, a, a quick answer. Thank you very much, he said. Off he went. 15 minutes later, Bill was back at my desk. Excuse me, could you spare me a minute? I said, yes, of course. And he asked me the same question again, but it was rephrased, probably hoping that I didn't realize it was the same question, but it was. And my reaction wasn't one of annoyance. My reaction was about me. My reaction was, I must have made a very bad job of explaining that if he didn't understand it. So this time I explained it in minute detail. And at the end of it, I thought to myself, I didn't say it out loud. I was quite pleased with that. Even I understood it. <laughs> Bill said, oh, thank you very much, and off he went. <clears throat> you guessed it, 15 minutes later, Bill was back. And he asked me, yes, the same question, rephrased yet again. And I just sat back in my chair. And I said, Bill, what are you trying to do? And he literally straightened himself up like this and said, I'm trying to do such and such. I said, no, you're not. He said, yes, I am. I said, no, you're not, Bill. I said, what you're trying to do is to protect the bank in case the boss has done a duff lending. And there was about two or three seconds pause. And then it was just as if a light had come on his face and he said, oh yes. Off he went and the job was done. You see, what he was doing, if you could imagine an enormous picture, a painting, and somebody is trying to describe this painting by using a magnifying glass on one little tiny bit. 
I explained to them, what you've got to look at is the whole picture and where your particular bit that you're doing today fits in. Without seeing the big picture, you don't see the picture at all. All you see is your little bit. And that is the danger with just homing in on Good Friday itself, if we aren't very careful. So I would encourage us all, no matter how many years we've been on a journey, to keep things in our mind, at the back of our mind, so that we can see things where they fit in in the big picture. And the question today is, what is good about Good Friday? As I said, the teaching concerning Good Friday, together with all those other things that I mentioned, are essential, uh, fundamental parts of the Christian message. They are not optional as regards our relationship with God. We cannot pick and choose, awful as Good Friday was. So there are just a, a few things I would particularly like to draw to our attention. Firstly, without Jesus dying on the cross, paying for our sins, we could not have been forgiven by God. It's as simple as that. We're used to seeing in our day special offers, time limited, once for all. Let me tell you, Jesus was all that. It was a once for all sacrifice on the cross. And it's time limit, yes, our life. It's no good people thinking they're going to turn up at some pearly gate and try and persuade St. Peter looking over there to uh, let you in. The decision is made in this life and we have to always remember that. There is no another chance after the grave. Secondly, although we haven't read about it today, we are particularly remembering all that led up to the crucifixion. The Last Supper, Gethsemane, Pilate and Herod's interrogation. I won't call them a trial, they were just a mockery. The treatment given by the soldiers that we read about. The insults from the Jewish religious leaders who should have known better. And what was going on? Behind it all was the Jewish leader's determination to kill Jesus. Now, I want us to remember that. They didn't just want to stop him preaching a message. The time had passed for that. They wanted to kill him. The Bible says they wanted to kill him. They wanted any opportunity. They couldn't find a legitimate one, so they came and had a trumped up one. That is how evil the religious leaders were. We also remember Pilate's final condemnation of Jesus, despite his wife saying to him, the warning that she had had horrible dreams about this. Why? The Bible doesn't tell us, but the Roman records do, that Pilate was almost on probation because he'd uh, messed things up elsewhere and he'd been sent to this eastern outpost of the Roman Empire 
and uh, he was supposed to be trying to uh, keep the place in order. And he'd been trapped by the Jewish leaders. And he had a choice to make, and he made the choice. He preferred to look after himself, his job, his prestige, rather than tell the Jewish leaders, because he must have known exactly what they were up to. He was there at the time. And following the crucifixion and Jesus' death, the tomb. That is where the story, as it were, ends today. But let us look at this Following these events, we see that Jesus, who as his name tells us he was born to be the saviour, became a sin bearer for us. And his sacrifice was sufficient, as the prayer in the Church of England says, it was a complete and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. That is absolutely true. That's the 1665 prayer book. I'll give them full marks for that. Absolutely correct. But, and there's a big but. And that is, although the provision is made for all the sins of all the people of all time, it would only apply to those who accepted Jesus' sacrifice. I don't know how many of you have been to funerals and it uh, grates with me when I've been in the Church of England once and just listening to the prayers, the assumption is that the person in the coffin is going to heaven. It doesn't matter who it is, they could be the biggest rogue out. But let's get this quite clear, that the provision that Jesus made to cover all sin of all time for all people only applies if we are, as Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. That is a crucial part of it. And the reality is, when we look back, even in the Old Testament, you can look in Ezekiel, there's just one particular place, but there is no suggestion that everybody is going to heaven. It talks on a number of occasions through scripture of the remnant, the few. There's no question, no mention of we're all in it together and we're all going to heaven. We are not. And if we allow people, even our generation, when we meet people, to continue in that attitude without challenging them, we are not doing them any favour. We need to present the word of God, even in ordinary conversation. Only to those who confess their sin and repented and accepted Jesus' sacrifice would benefit from Jesus' sacrifice. He became the sin bearer by being what scripture calls the spotless lamb of God. <clears throat> there is another thing, and it's an old word, and I said to Trevor Rhymes, it's the first time last Sunday I'd ever heard it said in a sermon, this word. And it's there 
in the scripture. It's in the King James, it's in the New King James. And it says in 1 John chapter 2 verse 2 and in chapter 4 verse 10, this truth. And that is that he is the propitiation for our sins. Now, we use another word, atonement, and apparently in English there was no such word until the translators doing the authorised version uh, came to that. And they had to make a word or phrase and they settled on a word, atonement, and it actually means at one. We are made at one with God, unified again with God. Propitiation is an old word, and it doesn't just apply to the Bible. If I upset any of you, and I think afterwards, oh dear, I've upset them. Oh dear, what shall I do? I know what I'll do. And I take a little present and I go to them and I say, I'm sorry I upset you. I brought you this, just as a token that I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? And they say, yes. That has been a propitiation. It has turned away the person's wrath. It's bad enough when we have upset somebody in this life. But it's far more serious when we realise that we were actually born with a nature which is against God and we've upset Almighty God. And there is no present that we could bring to appease his wrath. So how was this appeasement? The appeasement was with what Jesus did. He died on the cross. You see, he paid the debt that we owed. In a sense, we couldn't pay the debt. But the reality is, all sin has to be paid for. Hell was never designed for believers. It was designed for the devil and his fallen angels. And that's where unrepentant sinners end up. It's as simple as that. The gospel message is a very, very simple one. But in being the propitiation for our sins, turning God's wrath away from our sins, he also became the one who reconciled us to God. He became the one who made us at one with God. He became the atoning sacrifice. It wasn't just a sacrifice, an atoning sacrifice. And it's important that we recognise this. He paid our debt. We are forgiven. We are reconciled to God. And God's wrath has been turned away from us. When Jesus died, his disciples, to say the least, were disillusioned, bewildered. And uh, we do have accounts of them going back to their jobs, as it were. All their hopes had just vanished. And when we read of the account of the disciples going to Emmaus and a stranger coming alongside, it's very interesting to read what the, the comments were. We'd thought that he would be the one to deliver us. But the problem was the people, including the disciples, 
had got a skewed idea of Messiah. Them, the Messiah they basically wanted was someone to get rid of the Romans and give us our country back. They failed so often, particularly the ordinary people who were quite happy to take part in the miraculous feeding of the 5,000, the 4,000, to see people healed. They were quite happy for that. But were they prepared to accept him as their Lord and Master? And that is the big question for all of us. But there's another thing about Jesus dying on that cross. Because although the people were looking for a different kind of Messiah to the one they actually got, who was God the Son, not just a military deliverer, we need to remember that when he died on the cross, he was not killed by men. The Roman crucifixion was barbaric to say the least. It was done deliberately. It was normally take a long while. And even in the account of what happened at that time with Pilate, he was surprised with Pilate that Jesus was already dead. Better check, you know. And what had happened? Well, a soldier stabbed him with a spear and it says, out came blood and water. And it also says that they didn't break his legs because that would hasten death for the other two. You see, Jesus wasn't killed by man. He yielded up his spirit, the Bible tells us so. He cried out with a loud voice, It is finished. There's somebody else who was uh, obviously looking on. We're not told about him in the Bible. But he was obviously looking on. ready for his moment of triumph and he's called Satan and he must have got the biggest surprise of his life because if he could have killed Jesus he could have stopped things in the track and it looked as though everything was going that way until Jesus gave up his spirit and he knew that it had all been in vain for him. He'd lost again, as he had every time. In the passage we read, it tells us, and it was symbolic, that the temple veil was ripped from top to bottom. A very heavy material just ripped apart. It also tells us that there were those people who came up out of the graves. What the people of Jerusalem must have thought, I wouldn't even like to imagine. These people just walking around, the earthquake. The only thing that we know was an actual reaction is quoted in that passage when the Roman soldiers said, surely this was the Son of God. I wonder what their feelings were for that time. Jesus had come as Saviour. 
He told us in John chapter 3 and verse 7 that we must be born again. There's no option. It's the only way. He paid our debt. He had reconciled us to God. And when we look at Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to 10, we see in that that the whole matter of salvation is a sovereign work of God. There's nothing we can do to make ourselves appealing to God, that God would even consider having us because we were his enemies. It's all of God. A sovereign work, nothing of our works. It's purely by grace, through faith, not of works. And finally today, I would just like to mention, we must always keep in mind when we are talking to people, when we are reading God's word, that this salvation is the only way to be right with God. It isn't a way, it is the only way. And it is only available during our earthly life whether that be long or short. It is the only way, and it is God's way. And it is up to each person who hears the gospel to believe, to accept. No one can do it for us. It can't be done by proxy. We have to come individually, personally, to accept God's offer of mercy. His divine act, his grace, and his mercy. As I said, the question was asked of us some years ago, what's good about Good Friday? Well, it was a terrible scene, God the Son dying on a cross. Well, it was good because through it, the crucifixion and the resurrection, we can be made right with God. God's offer and grace and mercy are still available to us today. We don't know what the next moment holds, but at the moment, his grace and mercy are still here, available to all those who will submit and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. That is the good news, that all who accept Jesus as their Lord will be forgiven. About 150 years ago, the great German composer we call him Richard Wagner. He wrote an opera called Tannhäuser. And it's typical of some of the things that he wrote, which were based on what we call Christian legend. In other words, it's typical Roman Catholicism. And it has a man, we describe him as a playboy. And he comes to realise just how bad he is. So he decides he'll go to Rome and see the Pope and confess what he's done and have forgiveness. And he gets to Rome and he sees the Pope. And he tells the Pope all that he's done and the Pope says, Phew, you're too bad. Can't forgive you. And he comes away completely devastated. He's obviously destined for hell. So he decides he might as well go and enjoy life even more the same way that it was before. Let me tell you, friends, that isn't true with Jesus. No matter how bad somebody has been in the ordinary mortal life, 
Forgiveness is the same. There's no different standard. It's a complete forgiveness. The Bible describes it as being as far as the east is from the west. It's complete. Someone described it as God puts our sin in his forgettery. To be remembered no more. We are forgiven. Hallelujah. If we surrender our life to God, accept Jesus Christ as Saviour, that is what it is all about. Jesus did it. That's why today we remember Good Friday.